Welcome. We're glad you're here and hope you enjoy the service today. Service begins in one minute. Welcome to Ovation Church. Service is about to begin. together I saw Satan fall like lightning I saw darkness run for cover still the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven come on I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrected Sons and daughters, I'm all with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony. This is my 
hot today. Come on now. Don't be shy. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough.
Can somebody just shout if God has been good in your life? Come on. King Jesus, we're gonna keep we're gonna keep singing about your goodness, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God.
Well, hey, thank you for joining us here at Ovation. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning as we celebrate God's goodness. Before you are seated this morning, will you just say hello to someone nice to you? Say good morning. I'm glad to see you here today. And you can be seated this morning too. Hey, if you are joining us online, welcome to Ovation Church. We're glad that you are able to join us. We wish that you were here today, but we're glad for the gift of technology that you are able to tune in today. Well, hey, there's a couple of things I'd love for you guys to, to know about today. First, if you haven't um, had the opportunity to fill out our connection card, maybe you're new and um, you just haven't taken a minute to do that yet, and we'd love for you to do that. You can pull out your mobile device at any point during the service and fill that out online at ovation.church slash connect or there's physical connection cards in the seat backs in front of you. But, you know, we know that sometimes when you step into a new church, it can be difficult um, to know what to do, to know any of the people or know anything about the church. And we just want to make that easy for you. And so this is a way for us to do that, to give you some information about the church, answer any questions that you might have. And you can give us feedback, um, too, uh, as we email you this week um, when you fill that out. But also, if you're here in the sanctuary and you fill that out either by phone or uh, with a physical card. And if you stop by our info desk as you exit today, we'd love to give you a, a gift um, today. But hey, also a couple of things that are happening that are coming up. Next week, we have a very special guest speaker. Um, his name is Chris Palmer. And, you know, I know sometimes when um, churches have guest speakers, you're tended to like jet because pastor's not speaking. Well, I want to tell you this guy is so um, incredibly special to our family because he's the dean of Theos University, which is a um, it's an online um, university that our family has grown and learned so much from. So when I say that he's a guest speaker coming, he has actually um, imparted so much knowledge, um, biblical knowledge into our family as a pastor's family. And so we are bringing that to you next week. Um, Chris is actually the um, dean at the OSU, but he's also a Greek New Testament scholar. He's an author of like eight books, all the things. So be here, mark your calendars and be here next week. You will get something from um, the message next week. And we're going to be here um, too. So join us for that next week. Also coming up is water baptism. Um, we have water baptism event happening in two weeks. And if you've never um, taken that step in your faith and been water baptism, or baptized, then we invite you to do that. We want to celebrate with you. And when, we make, when we make that commitment to serve Christ f with our lives, and then water baptism is that next step. And it's this outward sign of an inner change that's happening on the inside of us. And you know, maybe we've seen water baptism before and you didn't, you haven't done it yet, and you're like, I don't know, do we really need to do that? Well, we see in Scripture that Jesus uh, was baptized as he before he began his ministry, and so we follow his example through water baptism baptism. So if you'd like to be part of that, then you can sign up at ovation.church slash events, or just go to the webpage and click on the events tab. And there's a place where you can register so that we know that you're going to be there for water baptism. And um, we'll send you this week, we're going to be sending out lots of details on that so that you can be prepared and know all of the things to know. And um, we will celebrate with you. We love baptism and we celebrate, absolutely celebrate with you. So um, sign up for that. But then also, before we get to today's message, we want to take a moment um, and honor God with our giving. It's an avenue for us to worship God. The same way we worship him with our um, singing and with song, we also worship him through our finances. It's a way that we place him first. We recognize that he has given all things to us, that he has created all, and that he's been faithful um, in our lives and providing for us and being there with us. And so we are giving today out of a grateful heart. And there's a couple of different ways that you can give this morning, and of course they'll have those on your screen. And we also of envelopes in the seat backs if you would like to fill one out physically and you can drop it in a giving box as you exit um, by the doors. Or there's the app. I love using the app. Um, there's the online at the website and the giving tab. But either way, um, let's pray over our giving as we honor God today. Father, we thank you so much for all that you have given us, Lord. Lord, you've been so good to us. As we sang this morning, you've been so good and so faithful. And it's an honor and a privilege that we have to serve you. 
And Lord, we, as we give today, Lord, we do it with a heart of worship, a heart of gratitude for your faithfulness. And Lord, we thank you um, for the rest of the service today as well. We thank you for the message that you have prepared for us today. And we open our hearts and our ears to hear from you. Speak to our hearts. Speak into our lives today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you guys welcome Pastor Jesse this morning? Y'all, thank you. Come on, keep giving Jesus a hand this morning. Uh, we have some uh, things going on in our world right now. I don't know if you saw the uh, attacks on uh, Israel and obviously what's been going on in Ukraine and Russia and just all the turmoil that is in our world. And so before I get into the message, let's pray uh, for uh, peace, uh, terrain, um, for uh, innocence to be protected, and uh, for God to uh, move in this world. We need him to move. So let's pray. God, thank you for your goodness and your mercy that we have each experienced or have the opportunity to experience in our lives individually. But God, your word says that you can even move the hearts of kings and leaders. And so, Lord, I pray that your power is at work and active, even in the chaos that we see happening, that, God, you can move to perform your purpose, to perform your will, and that, God, innocence is uh, protected, that, God, uh, lives can be saved, and that harm and destruction that an enemy would want to bring, our spiritual enemy, the adversary of our soul that has, wants to bring death and destruction in your creation, Lord, I pray that evil overcomes good. Lord, I pray that uh, I'm sorry, I, I pray that good overcomes evil, Lord. Lord, we, we disagree with what I just said, but Lord, that evil is overcome by good. And that God, your will, when you created the earth and you saw it, it was at peace and it was good. And sin has destroyed that. And so God, I pray that goodness would rise up in people. Goodness would rise up in nations. And combat evil that is at work. Combat uh, uh, death and destruction that is at work. And God, I pray that whatever deception is happening, whatever ulterior motives are at play between different powers at play and all of that, that God, all of those things come to light. And that they can't just breed in the darkness and the shadows. But that God, your peace and your justice would reign in this earth. God, as in earth, as in heaven. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done in this earth. And so, God, I pray that we see that happen in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, have you ever struggled with guilt? Have you ever done something and been ashamed, remorseful, and maybe even some time has gone by, you've apologized to a spouse, you, you apologize to a coworker, an employee, uh, but yet there's still this sense of guilt or baggage that is weighing you down because of that circumstance, because of that event that happened in your life that you went through and you own your part of it. And you know that you did something that you weren't supposed to do. This idea of taking responsibility and feeling the, the weight of guilt is actually something that we're trained with pretty early in life. And parents, we can do this to our children in even a very negative way, where we want to pile on the guilt to make sure that they feel extra bad for what they did. And, and sometimes, parents, we have to recognize that, that we're piling it on in a very unhealthy way, in a very negative way. Nothing is wrong, parents, with addressing the issue. In fact, you should address the issue. You should bring correction. But yet, we can sometimes take it further than it should go because somehow we feel like that's the best way to train them to avoid this behavior in the future is to make sure that they really have guilt to the tens, right, right, to the max. And, and so we do that in the early stages. Like, do you feel really bad about what you just did? We might ask a kid. Like, do you feel really bad? Like, look at what you did to your sibling. Look at what you did to the broken TV that's on the floor right now. Right? Look at what you did. And, and we pile it on 
when they already feel sorry, they're already crying, they're already remorseful, but we sometimes keep piling it on. And so we learn this from a very early age. Now, when we get a little bit older, we don't need somebody to even tell us. We know that what we did was wrong. Whether it was in a dating relationship situation, whether it was in a job situation, uh, stealing something from your office, uh, taking a phone call that was commissioned for another person, but you do it on the download so that you get the commission for it, and you're like, I hope nobody knows this, hope nobody sees this, hope nobody finds me out. And we know what guilt feels like, even if we're the only ones that know what we did. And here's the thing is that guilt is a natural, normal, even proper response to when we do wrong. Guilt is actually something that is a conscience that God is uh, embedded in us to know that we're not living right and that we're outside of his will for our lives, that, that we have fallen short of his glory in his standard. And so guilt is a normal, natural response to that. And we've all sensed that and we've all felt that. But I want you to think about what it says in Psalm 38, chapter 4. It says, my guilt overwhelms me. It is a burden too heavy to bear. So when we do something wrong, when we make mistakes, when we mess up, when we sin, there's a conscience that is uh, broken, a conscience that is in us that is stricken, and we would use the English term guilt, and there's a negative guilt and a positive sense of guilt that we'll get into in a minute. But when our conscience is stricken, when our heart is broken for the way that we've acted or the way that we've lived, that's a normal response to wrongdoing. And it's like a warning light on our dashboard of our life saying, this isn't working right in your life. You can't continue this way and produce a life that is good. If you continue acting and behaving and living this way, continue treating people this way, continue making decisions this way, warning, 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 it only leads to destruction in your life. And so that conscience that we have is a good thing. So we don't want to live with that hurt conscience. We don't want to live with that that tension and frustration that it creates in our life. So the question is, is what are you going to do to face, to deal with the guilt that you encounter in life when you do something wrong, when you make a bad choice, especially in the spiritual sense, a Christian sense of knowing that God has a standard and then you don't live up to it. What are you going to do when you're faced with that guilt? Now, we live in a world right now that has chosen to deal with that conscience issue, the guilt issue, in a way that does not honor God. I want you to think about this, uh, and maybe in your own life, but then also we can see this on a larger scale within this world, is rather than acknowledging it for what it is, they decide to legalize it. And what I mean by that is they make what was wrong right. Therefore, I'm not wrong anymore. I don't have to be guilty. Right? So I don't want to live with guilt. So rather than addressing the behavior and the actions that do, so that it won't lead to guilt, instead, I'm just going to say this behavior is now right. So therefore, I can do it without a conscience issue so that I can do it now without feeling guilty. And so they try to legalize it. Um, Do you do that in your life? Maybe for some of you, there's an issue in your life that if you were honest evaluating yourself, maybe months ago, years ago, you felt bad about certain behaviors, certain habits or temptations or or things you were giving into in life, and, and you knew God had something better for you, but you've not dealt with it for so long, you don't even really feel bad about it anymore. You've just accepted it as part of your character. You've accepted it as part of who you are, and, well, it's never going to change. And so instead of being guilty about it, you've just minimized it, legalized it in a sense, so it's not even a big deal anymore. We do that individually. We do that as a culture. We do that as a nation. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's moral. They can legalize murder. That doesn't mean God's okay with it, right? And so God has a standard, and when we break that standard, it sears our conscience. Our our conscience is broken for that. And then are we going to legalize it, or are we going to apologize for it? 
And the right way to handle it is to acknowledge our wrongdoing and then to apologize for it, to repent of it. That, not, not change it and say what was wrong is now right so I don't have to feel bad about it. But yet we see that happening in our culture and in our world. So as we go through life and we make some mistakes, we, there's some regrets, then our life becomes pretty messy, kind of like the first half of this clean slate. And it's marked by sin. It's, it's marked by things we shouldn't have done. And if we don't have forgiveness, if we don't follow what we're talking about today and what God provides for us to be wiped clean of that and move forward without guilt, we're going to be carrying that with the rest of our lives. It's going to be affecting our future for the rest of our lives. And our guilt is going to tie us to something that God's already forgiven us of. And so we have to deal with this in the right way. Guilt demands a response. Are we going to legalize it or are we going to apologize for it? Listen to what Psalm 32 says. Psalm chapter 32 verse 1 says, Oh, what joy. This is what God wants us to experience. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven. Those whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived, get this, in complete honesty. The freedom that comes from a clear conscience being forgiven, you're not trying to hide wondering if somebody's going to figure you out. When we're dealing with guilt or shame or uh, unconfessed sin, something that hasn't been dealt with, then it feels like you're living a lie. None of us want to be a hypocrite. Uh, there's this built-in mechanism inside of us to not be a hypocrite. And, and so when we're living that way, when uh, we have broken our uh, inner character and we haven't even lived up to our own standards, then all of a sudden the guilt and the shame of that, if it's left unaddressed, then you're hiding. You're wearing masks the rest of your life. This is going to affect every relationship you have. Because what's going to happen is you're going to say, they say they love me, but if they really knew me, they wouldn't. If they really knew the way that I treat it, if they really knew the thoughts that I had, if they really saw me for, for the brokenness that I've lived, if they find me out, if they see me for who I am, they're going to fire me at work. The, the spouse is going to leave me. My kids are going to want nothing to do with me. I can't serve at the church if they know about this stuff in my life. I'm going to walk into church and I'm going to get struck by lightning. I'm going to burst into flames. If people only knew the things that are in my shadows and in the darkness of my soul, right? And so if we're not honest, then we live this life with these walls up. We're never really connected with the people in our lives. That's a lonely, lonely way to live. And no matter how much somebody expresses their care for you, how much somebody expresses their concern or love for you, you never truly feel loved because you think if they really knew, they'd reject me. God has seen all of it. And... God still loves you. And even Christians are called through the power of the Holy Spirit to show love to people that don't deserve it. And, and so even in the church sense, that even with our flaws and, and, the, and the things that aren't perfect in our lives, we shouldn't have to hide them from others. We can actually deal with them together, confess our sins to each other, to have forgiveness, to break the power of those things in our life, to, to live a victorious life for Christ. We can do that without being guilty and hiding in the shadows and keeping everybody at arm's length. No, Jesus has cleansed us. Jesus has wiped away the past, made all things new, and so now we can step into forgiveness. We can step into a new life without the guilt of the past, keeping everybody away. And so we can deal with these things in the right way. What joy there is for those who have been forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. There is a joy whose record the Lord has cleared of this guilt. We want to receive that. But verse 3 says this, when I refused to confess my sin, 
Think about this a second. When I refused to confess my sin, when I continued living my life in a way that didn't acknowledge my wrongdoing, that didn't apologize for it, maybe I justified it, made excuses for it, blamed it on other people. When, when I live that way, this is what happens. When I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away. There's a physical effect that this has on it. The emotional effect, the spiritual effect, but there's even a physical effect that when we're carrying shame and guilt, it weighs us down even physically. My body wasted away and I groaned all day long. What a miserable way to live. Day and night, get this, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. When we're outside of God's uh, uh, blessing and favor and, and the way that he has directed things. We're outside of that. It's not a good life to live. It's not a fun life to live. Your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Interlude. Uh, whenever, uh, I, I love saying interlude because uh, these are actually like songs. Uh, this is a psalm. In, in the book of Psalm, and so that's either poetry or songs, and, and so music was written to this, and so I don't know if this is just my generation thing and how I grew up, or maybe I'm just, uh, I'm just weird. What I think of when I see interlude, I think of guitar solo. Okay, so, so he's singing the song about being forgiven, my soul wasting away. And so I think of like a desert music video from like the 90s, like a big hair band. And it's like the solo time, the wind's blowing, the hair's blowing, slow motion. And he's like doing this riff. That's what I picture right there, okay? And so interlude. And so there's the guitar solo about the wasted soul and the, uh, the, the, the darkness that he was feeling and all of the oppression that he was under. But then it says after the guitar solo... Verse 5, finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. We don't have to carry the weight of the guilt. We don't have to be trapped in the remorse and the regrets of the past. All my guilt is gone. Interlude. That's going on again. I love that. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you, get this, while there's still time. Before the song ends. While there is still time. That they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. So this gives us a picture uh, the, this contrast between how we address and deal with this guilt. We, we, went, we make a mistake, we fall short of the glory of God, and then there's this sense that, oh, I was wrong. Then are we going to excuse it? Are we going to refuse to confess it? Are we going to make excuses for it, justify it, blame other people? Are we going to uh, uh, try to justify it to just say, well, it wasn't really all that bad. It's now actually a good thing to do, and I don't have to feel bad about it. Or are we going to really address it for the rebellion where we said, God, I want my way, not yours. That's what rebellion is. Rebellion is saying, I don't want to do it your way. I want to do it my way. And anytime we do that, we're wrong for it. And it starts to eat at our soul. But if we confess it, he's faithful to forgive it. And I love what it says. I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. Even when you wronged your spouse, you wronged the Lord. When you wronged your employer, you wronged the Lord. And so we have to see things that ultimately it is the holiness of God that was offended by my behavior. I wronged this person. I mistreated this person, but I also hurt the heart of God. And so when I apologize to them in the natural, I need to be taking care of it in the spiritual too. And I need to repair something with God. And I need to confess. I need to receive forgiveness. That's how we address this guilt. And so I don't know what kind of guilt you might be carrying. Relationships that are broken, divorces that have happened, uh, people that won't speak to you anymore, bankruptcy that you're ashamed of, and, and different turmoil that has been caused by all of that. And you're thinking, that has now defined who I am, and that defines who I will be. God gives you a clean slate. 
That this is the issue of forgiveness and what Jesus does to take away the old and to make all things new. Meaning that that thing back there that is trying to make you feel guilty doesn't have to affect your future. And that you can actually live a new life. I want you to think about this, that every saint has a past. Every saint has a past. Every saint has made mistakes. Every saint has sinned. Every uh, character in Scripture in the Old Testament, even uh, Psalm, David wrote many of those. He, he committed adultery. He committed murder. And yet he still has a heart after God. And, and so every saint has a past. Your past doesn't mean you can't be a saint. Your past doesn't mean you can't have a future with God. Every saint has a past, and every sinner has a future. Your sin doesn't mean that God is done with you. There is still time right now to repent. There is still time right now to acknowledge and to confess your rebellion. And there is still time to receive forgiveness. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. There's two feelings that describe guilt, that are a little bit more theological. And so I want us to think of it in these terms. One is kind of a positive side of guilt. One's a negative side. And we need to know the difference between them because God never operates in the one and always operates in the other. And so it's conviction versus condemnation. Conviction says what you did was bad. There's something better for you. It calls you to a better life. But condemnation says you are bad. And, and, and so God works in conviction to bring correction so that it points you to a future that is better than what you're experiencing. And it's always full of hope that there's a better future, there's a better choice, there, there's something good for you. Uh, conviction always builds where condemnation always tears down. Condemnation says there's no hope. You're a horrible person. You're always going to be a horrible person. If you fail in this marriage, you're going to fail in the next marriage. That's condemnation. You can't get your finances right. You're bankrupt now. You can't work a budget now. You're always behind. The car's going to get repoed. You're a mess with finances. You're always going to be a mess with finances. You might as well not even try. That's condemnation. Condemnation leads to no hope. Condemnation just tears down and tears down. Conviction says... The way you're living right now is not going to produce the life that God has for you. God has something better for you. You need to leave this to embrace this to experience what God has for you. Conviction points to a future, into a hope. Here's another thing, is that condemnation is always broad. Condemnation piles on. You never take out the trash. <laughs> you're always late for a project at work. Uh, you, you don't show up at time for the kids' soccer game or this or that. You don't serve at church, and you should be giving more, and, and the Netflix account this, and the stuff that you watch that, and you speed, and you cut somebody off when you're taking the exit. And, and so it's like, like all of it. I'm, not, I'm a horrible person. Why did I get out of bed this morning? It's broad, and it just piles on. It piles on. That's condemnation. This is what conviction does. And honestly, we know there's a lot of things in our lives that need to be straightened out. It's not just one issue, and we know that. But this is what conviction does by the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Don't use that tone of voice with your kids. It's specific. And it will deal with that issue. And it won't pile on all of these other things at the same time. It'll deal with one issue at a time in specific. Conviction is pointing you to a future that creates a better life for you and what God's designed for you. And the Holy Spirit will deal with specific things in your life at specific moments and specific times so that you can overcome those things, so that you don't have to keep living trapped in these uh, behaviors or, or uh, wrong living patterns that don't produce what God has for you in your life. Conviction. And so with that, we should welcome conviction. We should be thankful for conviction. And so when there is that conviction, and we might use the word guilt, but I think it more appropriately it would be conviction, is when we're convicted instead of justifying it, instead of making excuses and saying, well, yeah, I used that tone because she burnt the toast and uh, 
she deserves it, and uh, she had a headache last night, and, and so, yeah, so I'll be rude this morning. I, I, I'm justified in being rude because of X, Y, Z. That's not the way, right way to deal with conviction. When we're convicted, we acknowledge it. We take responsibility for it. We repent of it, and we allow the Holy Spirit to change us and transform us into who God's calling us to be, to live that new life that he has for us. Instead of repeating those patterns of the past and trapped in all of that, all of that is gone. God's given us a new way to be human, a new way to live, a new way to honor him with our lives. Godly conviction is always specific. Condemnation is always broad. This is what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. We don't have to live in guilt. We don't have to be defined by the past. If we have surrendered our hearts to God, if we have uh, invited him to be our Lord, to be our Savior, then we're not defined by that. We don't have to be condemned by that. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ. But if, there, if you don't belong to Christ, there is still condemnation at work. There is condemnation active in people's lives that are not belonging to Jesus Christ. Verse 2, and because you belong to him, this is what it says, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. There is a freedom that you now have because of Christ to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, to live the clean life, the new life, not be trapped in the past. The Holy Spirit is working in you, and you are not defined by what you have done. You are now defined by Jesus Christ, and that's your identity and who you are, so you don't need to see yourself as that old person. You don't need to see your identity as who you used to be. You might get around friends friends that knew you then, and they try to pull you back. You used to laugh at these kind of jokes. You used to be fun to be around. You're, you're, you're no fun unless you got four beers in you, and, and whatever it is, and they try to pull you back. You can, and that's not me anymore. That's not who I am. That is gone. The new has come, and we live a new life, and we reject the work that Satan's trying to do to pull us back into that. It, guilt is a powerful emotion. Guilt is a powerful situation, and you will have people trying to use guilt to control you. You get around family members at uh, holidays, and, and all of a sudden, a parent, a sibling is bringing up some past issue to get their way, and they know if they can control you with guilt, then all of a sudden, it benefits them somehow. At your work, can guilt you. Well, you know, if you take vacation, it means Sally has to work extra hard. And, and if you do this, then you, you want to go to church on Sundays. Well, you know that that means X, Y, Z. And they try to guilt you to control you to ways that benefit them. Church. Church can use guilt to try to control you. You know, if you don't give more, then you're, Jesus isn't even happy with you. And, and if you're not a, a giver and tither, and you, you need to show us your uh, budget and your bank accounts and turn all of that in so that we can look at that to make sure you're really a good Christian or however that might be done, and, and try to guilt you, try to twist your arm. That's not a good way to live life. You know, the, the churches could guilt you to say, if you're not serving, you're probably not a very good Christian. You, you should be serving more, showing up earlier, staying later, doing more, sacrificing uh, other things in your life to be able to uh, serve at a certain level and expect more and expect more and expect more. And they use guilt as a control mechanism. Is it right to be generous? Absolutely. The Bible talks about that. Not because out of a motivation of guilt. Is it good to serve and use your gifts and abilities to help others and serve others? Absolutely. That's what the Bible teaches. Not out of guilt, though. Guilt is the wrong motivation for any of that. And, and so we can't allow guilt to try to lead us and guide us, control us, and to, and to push us through life. That, there's misery with that. And so we have to reject that and recognize it for what it is, surrender all of that to God, and live in the new life that he has given us. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. God's grace is greater than my guilt. I put your on there, but I just figured I'd say my. Personalize it. You can write it down and say, God's grace is greater than my guilt. God's grace is greater than my guilt. So if I'm struggling with something, 
not thinking I'm good enough, thinking I don't deserve something because these things happened to me, whether it was by my own choice or whether it was by others doing things that I was on the receiving end of it and there's shame or guilt associated with it. God's grace is greater than any of that guilt that's trying to trap you in the past. You can be set free by the power of Jesus and live a new life with a new direction, with new hope in what he's called you to be in that past doesn't get to determine the future that God has for you. God's grace is great enough. And you can be free of this and you can live a free life. And God's grace is never about us. God's grace is always about him. The, the grace that we receive isn't because I played my cards right just before God and now I've pleased him enough that I can now live in grace. No, grace is a character attribute of a goodness of God that is shown to us because of how good he is. All that you and I have to do is receive that grace. You and I can choose to reject it if we want, but you and I can choose to receive that grace and surrender to him and be set free from the mess of the past and live the life that he's called us to live. I love what 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says. But if we confess our sins to him, he can be depended on. Say depended on. He's faithful with this. He can be depended on to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. And it is perfectly, get this, it is perfectly proper for God to do this for us because Christ died to wash away our sins. I think that it's a joy and a pleasure that God gets out of doing this for us in our lives. Sometimes we can go to God and think that he's reluctantly just, I guess I have to forgive you because I said I would. You know, and we think like God's putting up with me. If our hearts are right, if we're really recognizing our brokenness and, and, and there is conviction there and the Holy Spirit's calling us into what he well, has for us and the future he has for us, and when we're honest and we're not trying to justify ourselves or wear a mask, but where we just lay our heart bare before God with all of our flaws, God gets great joy out of transforming us and out of washing us clean and setting us on a new path. It's not reluctant. It's not twisting his arm because he feels like he has to because, well, I'm a good God. I get a God. No. He takes joy in giving us grace and giving us mercy. You can also write this down. Your past, you could personalize it and put my past, must be forgiven and forgotten. My past must be forgiven and forgotten. Maybe you need to forgive yourself and you haven't forgiven yourself. Maybe you know God has forgiven you, but you still struggle with forgiving yourself. You still carry the weight of guilt knowing what you did and the pain that it caused and the ripple effects of that and the brokenness that is a result of it, and you're still carrying that. And it's been years and you've dealt with it, and you've changed, and you don't behave that way, you don't treat people that way, but there's still a heaviness that you haven't forgiven yourself. If you've confessed that, we just read that God can be depended on, he is faithful, he forgave us, he forgave you. Maybe it's time you forgive yourself. You stop holding that over your head. You stop letting that tie you to the past of who you used to be. You can be severed from that, and you can live the new life washed clean with a clean slate of what God does for you. So we forgive ourselves, but we can also stop thinking about it. We can also stop reminding ourselves of it. We can stop uh, uh, memorializing it on the certain dates or situations or holidays, always thinking about it and it coming up in our mind and remembering what happened. We can choose to forget about it. So we must be forgiven and we must forget. This is what Jeremiah 31, 34 says. And this is God speaking. It says, I will forgive their wickedness. I'm glad that God's forgiveness is available. But then he goes on to say, and I will never again remember their sin. 
I will never again remember their sin. Now, God is all-knowing, but yet in his power, he chooses not to remember it. He's not going to throw it back up in our face. He's not bringing it up every year at the anniversary. He's not, when another similar situation comes up, say, yeah, but you remember how you did it back there? He's not doing that. He's chosen to forget about it. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I... Yes, I alone will blot out your sins for my own sake and will never think of them again. God's making the choice to put it out of his mind, to not think about it, to not remember it. And you need to do the same. You need to forgive yourself, and then you also need to purposely forget about it. Make the choice to not memorialize it in your mind and keep thinking about it, memorizing it, God's not holding it against you anymore. You have been made right with him. The debt has been paid. There's nothing else owed. You're set free from that, and it's okay to move on. This is what Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 says. Paul, writing to the Philippians, he says, No, my dear brothers, I am still not all that I should be. But I am bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, choosing to forget the past. I can't change that situation or that circumstance. I can take responsibility today. I can confess. I can repent. But I can't keep thinking about that. I have to forget about that and move on with what God has for me. How does that play out in your life today? What is it that you've been holding on to in your memories, memorializing annually or with situations every time you see that person, when they post on social media, when you're reminded of this and it keeps playing over and over in your mind? It's time to be set free from that. That doesn't control you. You can forget the past. You can look forward to what lies ahead. Uh, Forgetting the past, that Greek word uh, forgetting, is epelanathan omahi. It sounds Hawaiian, I think, uh, but uh, I think I just ordered some sort of broiled fish in Hawaii. Uh, but uh, that word, it means to treat with thoughtful intention. This is purposeful. It means to banish from one's thoughts, to willfully neglect, to disregard on purpose, to leave behind intentionally, to cease remembering. And so where Paul says forgetting the past, he's very intentional to say, I'm not going to let those thoughts dominate my mind any longer. I'm not going to let the memory of that replay in my mind any longer. I intentionally choose to put that outside of my mind, to look forward to what God has for me, and to move forward with the clean slate he has given me and move into the new future that he has for me. You and I need to do that. God has done that. We just read how God has done that, and now we read how Paul is doing that. And so Paul is this example of a real person doing it. You can do it too. Through the work of the Holy Spirit and the power of Jesus, you can forget the past and look to the future. You can move forward with what God has for you. As the worship team comes up, I want to close with giving you an opportunity to examine your heart, to take account of where you're at in conviction or condemnation, And to confront the things that need to be confronted. And to respond appropriately to it. Maybe you've gotten to the place to where you're legalizing it instead of apologizing for it. And you need to stop making excuses and saying it's okay. It's not okay. And so confront it the way that it needs to be confronted. Maybe you're struggling with forgiving yourself or the thoughts, the memories... And you need to be able to forget about it. And you need the help of the Holy Spirit this morning to do that. Then I want you to evaluate your heart. Evaluate the condition of your soul. and Where you're at on conviction or condemnation. Let's pray. Close your eyes. I want you to start evaluating. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. Lord, you see every area 
of our hearts. You have taken away the old and made all things new. So God, I pray that whatever has been trapping people in the past, the guilt and the baggage and the remorse of certain situations that are still trying to weigh them down today, God, today, through the power of the Holy Spirit, there can be freedom. There can be forgiveness. We can even choose to remember no more and to forget those things. So, Lord, we welcome conviction. Holy Spirit, show us the areas where you're calling us to something better. Thank you for the power to overcome sin, to overcome temptation, that we don't have to live trapped in those old habits and the old life, that we can walk in this newness that you have for us. Holy Spirit, reveal our hearts. Search us. As we're praying, heads are bowed. If the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and you sense something in your heart that needs to change, something you need to repent of, something you need to confess, if there's something that you know God's forgiven you, but you're struggling with forgiving yourself and, and there's torment in your memories of the past and you need to forget those things. You can be set free this morning. If the Holy Spirit's dealing you on those lines of any of that, I just want you to raise your hand so I can pray with you. Raise your hand, leave your hand up a second. I see your hands, I see your hands. I see your hands, thank you. Leave your hands up as I pray. Holy Spirit, Continue to move in their hearts. Speak to their hearts, Lord. Lead them, guide them. Give them your grace and your mercy. Let them see the new life that you have for them. Sever the chains that have bound them to the past. Set them free from guilt, from shame. Let them see their identity in Christ and not in that situation, not in the past. That's not who they are. God, because of your goodness that you've shown to them, the grace that you've given to them, they can overcome the past. They can overcome that sin. Their minds can be renewed. They don't have to be controlled by the memory of those things. Lord, I thank you that this morning, Holy Spirit, you're setting them free this morning, severing that past, and they live a new life this morning, a clean slate with a new purpose, with a new hope of who you've called them to be. In Jesus' name, Amen. Give God a hand this morning. Hey, let's continue to sing and worship God. Would you stand up? We're going to sing graves in the garden. We're going to see God uh, uh, give us that new life that we've uh, been crucified with Christ. There's a grave that we've experienced, but we didn't stay there. We raised to life and we live a new life.